and we will do a bit of introduction, but not on a really on a name basis, but maybe it's good to introduce us very shortly. Um, well, you heard me over lunch, I think. My name is Marjan, I work at Dans in the Netherlands. Um, we're not a research organization, we're part of the Academy for Arts and Sciences, and we work in, as a service provider, so not a research organization. Uh, this whole week is about providing services and using services. And um, some services are big, uh, other services are a bit smaller. So if there's anyone else in the room who gets annoyed by their name tag dropping off, I have four sec security pins, so safety pins. So uh, the first four people who want a safety pin are welcome to uh, grab one. Um, so, so much for providing services. Um, handing over to you, Jorik. <laughs> uh, so I'm Jorik, I'm working for SURF, which is also an organization in the Netherlands. And we provide research support and services to mm. research and education in the Netherlands. So also not doing active research myself, but actively supporting research, as I would like to say. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, this is for the recording. It doesn't make my voice stronger, so when you notice I drop off, give me a sign. And at some point I'll hand over this thing to Jorik. So, um, but first let's get into action, and for that I'd like you to stand up and hear in the open space. Um, so we're not going to do anything scary, I think. Uh, uh, mm, mm. Okay. Because maybe you saw it at a glance, uh, the first action, um, shall I pick that one? So the first step in the program for this session is a bit of who is who. Uh, then we'll run through a bit of presentation and hands-on. Hands-on is not technical this afternoon, I think. Um, and we end with writing data management plans. So, but first, who is in the room? We have a couple of questions. Um, and I'd like to go you to go to a specific corner, depending on the answer. Um, first question, are you a PhD student, a master student, a data support, support person, or something completely different? And I know some of you will wear different hats, so you're very welcome to pick a corner. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> PhD student, master students, support, staff, other. So, I think we're in support. Yeah, so I would go to that corner. Um, we, ha we have this pillar in the room, but unfortunately, but let's. So, that's the PhD. That yeah. Okay, we do not have master students. Good. Master, okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> that, that is probably very typical. Many people here will have many hats on. So um, that is, will be a, an interesting week for you, representing all of the master students uh, <laughs> with, with you, of course. Uh, many PhD students, good. And people who say other, can I ask you what? I'm an undergrad student. Uh, I will be a uh, research scientist at the Umran Weekends. Uh, French. Okay. And this summer, hopefully, in two months. So I'm an undergraduate student right now. An undergraduate. Okay, very good. Welcome. Well, it's great to say. I'm also mm -hmm. undergrad. I mm -hmm. study electrical engineering and I will be, like, um, be a data support director on the middle I am. Okay. Uh, in a research lab on MR MR strength, so that's what I'm doing. Okay, welcome as well. So Victoria. I'm Aha, that's also good. Thing. Welcome. Um, I just got a bachelor's degree at my university, and also I'm working as a robots engineer in a big data project. So I can say that I just kind of support like, data processes in, in my project. So. Very nice. And welcome. You do not have a name tag yet, I think. What's the one for you on the table? Oh, you okay. Sorry. Well, you're a candidate for the safety pin then. <laughs> that's uh, good. Um, maybe as a second question, so um, new round, new chances. Do you represent mainly the life sciences, social sciences and humanities, natural and engineering sciences, 
Anything else? Life sciences domain, social sciences and humanities, natural and engineering sciences, any other? You <laughs> Many. Oh, I would say mechanical. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So some people are all over the place. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say so. What kind of engineering? All kinds. Of so, what do you identify most with? Okay. Okay. So it's. So what is obvious? Well, I think that engineering is there. So okay. Aha. I was already surprised that this corner was so cool. Okay. Okay. So this confusion is a good sign. <laughs> it's very nice to have many people working across boundaries and maybe the boundaries don't even exist. So, perfect. Anyone who, likes, who wants to like to explain their choice or who was hesitating very much? No? Okay, N go on to the next one. Um, so this is who was in the room. You can't read this. Are they yeah, I think you probably can, but don't try to. Uh, this is about data management planning, which is the topic of this session. So, um, what did we say? We have here, we have three corners here only. How experienced are you in the topic of data management plans? Have you written a data management plan or short DMP? Have you perhaps read one or contributed to it? Or is it completely new for you? So this is very experienced, somewhat, not yet. Well, that's the most experienced group who have written the um, data management plans. Yeah, I guess it makes sense if I move into that corner. Yeah, <laughs> 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 me too. And actually, where we're... we're when we prepared the session, we were very curious and we were hoping not too many people would end up here. Um, so that's, you're very welcome, of course. <laughs> for, for, what, <laughs> for what kind of project did you write a data uh, management plan? Um, uh. The European Market Observatory for Fisheries and Aquaculture. Okay. So I wrote the, the, the data management plan uh, from the data entry to uh, data processing and data destination. Very nice. Welcome. Let's see how you can contribute to uh, the rest. OK, uh, next question. We have six in total. So, FAIR is a kind of a buzzword sometimes. Um, there are so-called FAIR data principles. How So, okay, let's see over the course of this afternoon and the week if you are really so, if you are too modest perhaps, but at least you have all heard of them, which is good. And you can apply to them, I think, Rainy. Yeah, you can apply them, good. Uh, did you uh, help others perhaps in applying them? Very good. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one. Yeah. Um, it is one. So I don't know if you recognize this, but um, 
I sometimes have the idea that the fair principles are on a par with love and world peace and whatever. You can't be against it. Uh, a bit like open science, you can't be against it. But, yeah, that's easier said than done. Maybe that's one of the reasons why you applied to join this week. Um, are you familiar with buzzwords or prejudices or typical uh, um, um, expressions in this domain? So here's definitely not a good or a bad answer, but we are just curious, what do you associate with this notion of uh, fair? This is very much an open question, so please try. <laughs> I can give it a go. Sure. Mm. Anyone heard of, for example, as open as possible, as close as necessary? Some, so I think. Okay. Anyone heard of, it's a nice idea, but my situation is different? Okay. How do you feel about that one? Would you agree? Yeah. So, sorry to point at you, but I haven't registered your name yet. Can you tell why you won't agree? Uh, well, um. I think we can always find a reason to not uh, do the work that we should do. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> And do you have arguments or more arguments when, for instance, a colleague or a younger uh, student or researcher says to you, hmm, not for me? Uh, what do you mean? Can you clarify? Yeah. yeah. Well, what we some. So in application of new ideas? Application of new ideas, but also application of, let's say, requirements from the funder. I mean, I don't know if that applies to you or to whom it may apply, but research funders, European Commission, or perhaps your national funder, they are very much in favor of open science, uh, of open data, open educational research materials sometimes, but also of this fair idea that all data can be found, that you can access them, that you can combine them with other sources of data, so this is the interoperability thing, and in the end, that anyone can reuse them. But it's easy for them to say that. Um, and we encounter, um, so I think in your organization and in mine as well, many researchers and sometimes also head of research who say, uh, yeah, this is so much work. Um, I see what, what purpose it serves, but it's not possible. And I think for anyone who wants to work in the data domain, and especially if you're uh, supporting others, and you want to promote this, we need to have some arguments to negotiate and help people to say, okay, yeah, but there's also value in it for me. So I was, maybe in the course of this week, you get some more arguments um, to use when you encounter, let's say, a junior colleague who says, yeah, great idea, but it's not for me. Uh, or another excuse often is, I don't have data. Time. I don't have time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it costs a lot of electricity to store data, so that's more your knowledge in your organization. Tape, it's, there's no, not even electricity involved. Tape is an answer, perhaps, okay. Uh, no, uh, yeah, you're uh, right. Uh, it's, uh, it's all a balancing act. And uh, that's, that's, uh, but it's really nice if at least people, you can start discussion with people. Uh, no, no, I know. <laughs> I actually like that argument. If somebody would make an mm -hmm. argument, I would, I would like that. I would mm -hmm. like to start that discussion because mm -hmm. then it's worth mm -hmm. of storing the data versus the cost of storing the data. And then it's mm -hmm. not a um, kind of principal argument against it. Because mm -hmm. another one we sometimes hear is, well, I can spend a lot of time on making data fair, but mm -hmm. that won't get me any extra citations, for example. Mm -hmm. Which I would like to counter, counter argument because it will get you more citations, but it's mm -hmm. not directly serving the public. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, that's a nice one. Mm. Yeah. And the cost of generating the data again uh, should also be acknowledged. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There might be issues. Yeah. Yeah. It's sometimes very hard to pinpoint if it's uh, a real obstacle, I'm not allowed to share it, or um, if it's kind of laziness, easy thing, mm, I don't want to bother. So it was, yeah. But yeah, for instance, um, so over lunch I mentioned the, the taxpayer. I think both taxpayers don't know what we do with their money, um, but actually we do a lot. And uh, it's only that is, I think, a very strong argument against of, of, of in favor of open science and opening up materials. Uh, personally, I find it sometimes very hard when I prepare uh, for training materials to share them with the world because I also earn my salary, in a sense, with giving the same training again and again. So there, there, is, a, um, there is an issue there, and it's, I think, fair to acknowledge. On the other hand, um, part of my salary comes from these public funders. So I should comply with that. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, this is very strict. There will be more strictness because it is the whole idea. There is also always a tension between making as much as possible open and sticking to rules. Because if you don't follow rules, you are maybe creating things that are open, but are also open rubbish. They are not open reusable. So, okay. And I think the final question for this um, introduction is this one. So, any takers? What is this? Yeah, I know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And do you use the data life cycle in your work? Uh, yeah, I try to follow this uh, cycle. And also, I try to advise my case companies. So for them, it's not really a cycle. It's more a line that stops, yeah. Okay, yeah. Anyone else? Oh. Yes, yes, please. You use it for giving access, or no, not? Okay, is there a reason why do you, do you don't give access? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do you think that's possible to publish the? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully that will be a cycle as well, where others then maybe access the data. And, and use it so in addition to your papers. Oh. Oh. Okay. Is it this completely new for anyone? The idea that whatever domain you work in, there are typically some steps you go through? It's Okay, so and uh, what do you think your professor's attitude there is? Would they want to open up the data and share it, or do they say this is mine? Uh, it is like uh, the actual data is there with the institute, but this they just give us access for training for academic work. So the one you're presenting is to just grade you, assess how well you can do that. So we don't like this you need to do for. Mm. Okay.
did something right. Okay, thank you. Oh. Okay. Um, I didn't ask you anything. Do you have a point of view on the data life cycle? Uh, the, uh, well, so uh, mm. the, the most important part for what, uh, compared to what most researchers do, is uh, giving access to data and uh, reusing data because this is where the actual cost of, uh, of fear is. Um, <laughs> and it's an extra effort to do by the researchers because as a researcher mm. you do research, you produce results, you publish them mm. and uh, mainly this is your target because to build, to build your academic career you need publications, to preserve your academic career you need more publications but you are doing this research with taxpayers money and for what we will get back is to be able to reuse this mm. data and uh, provide access to it and this actually costs because what probably you'll hear more mm. about in this, uh, in this uh, workshop is, is the extra efforts and tools where you make the, mm. the data fair to make it findable, accessible, reusable and uh, 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 yeah, uh, interoperable and uh, usable, actually interoperable is the most uh, mm. uh, complex part so that you can link your data to other data. Mm. Uh, but uh, as I said, so this, these two, getting access to the data and make it reusable, it, it, it implies some effort, some time that the researchers need to do for, at the end, to be able to share the data mm. with others so that you don't keep your results on your laptop or your PC in your lab. Uh, but you are able to share it with other researchers and more people to get benefit of that. Mm. Thank you. You'll find out here more from this colleague on Wednesday afternoon. But don't, don't, this is not meant to keep you silent until then, of course. So, uh, okay, a couple of slides. Okay, did I skip one? Hmm. Okay, um, feel free to uh, find your seat. Uh, thank you for uh, this active part <coughs> so uh, no, so, so, mm, mm, uh, okay so okay um, there will be many buzzwords during this session fair is a buzzword Data management is another buzzword, what does it mean? But why should you do it? That is also, why is this important? Um, I think many of you know from experience or from uh, horror stories, um, it is possible that when you have stuff on a laptop and your laptop gets lost, of course not by fault of your own, uh, you have a problem. It will at least set you back in time if you do not have proper backup and stuff like that. So there's a very selfish reason why you would ma want to manage your data, at least at that basic level. But there are much more appealing uh, ways to do that or con uh, arguments. Um, it has been found, and this is not a promise, but it has been found that in various research domains, your publications will be cited more frequently when the data underlying the publication is also open and can be found easily in a serious repository. Now, typically that is one of the things that, um, and it is, a, I'm generalizing here, but researchers are in a sense trained to want to be visible. Um, that is how you, we are being judged. So when your work gets more vis visible by having also the data visible, properly documented and so on, um, there is a chance that your visibility increases, which is probably good. So that is an argument. There are also arguments that have to do more like the stolen laptop with uh, preventing risks. Um, when you do not manage your data properly, when you do not have a good idea of how many data you will have, what requirements there may be for how to store them or how to protect them, uh, it's probably not very effective, and in the end, you may have to pay more costs than when you had planned it from the start. I already mentioned the laptop that could get lost. Um, 
There is the risk that, and that's maybe more a risk for funders than for you yourself, um, but if no one keeps the data available and alive, we need to redo things, which is a bit silly and expensive. And if it concerns your own data, it's very costly because it will also take time away from the time granted to you in your PhD, for instance. So um, try to avoid that you have to redo experiments for this reason. And um, also document things in a way that you ensure that what you did last year is compatible with what you're doing now. It's very obvious, but still sometimes this goes wrong. That's probably because at the beginning there was not a clear plan how this research or research team even was going to manage the data. Um, and in the end, when it's just, like I said, bad open data, it's open, but yeah, open rubbish is also open. Um, and this is, of course, very extreme. There's not much use in sharing it with others and uh, you will not increase your visibility. So these reasons are related, but there are different aspects of why you should do it. You could also frame this in a more positive way, of course. When you publish a publication and you refer to the data uh, very explicitly, for instance, by having uh, a DOI for a data set, there are also other flavors of this kind of persistent identifier. More about that in a persistent identifier session tomorrow. Um, when you refer to it in a proper way, the chances increase that people see it and want to use it. And they will approach you because you were author, maybe even first author, of the publication. They may find your data in a repository like B2Find and approach you for that reason. Um, maybe you have also a public data management plan. It's not a requirement, I think, for most funders that you make it public. But yeah, why not share a good practice? And maybe others can uh, have the same approach as you have. And uh, of course, you can also look when you write a data management plan, what examples are out there in the world and see if you can use them for inspiration. Um, so it's perfectly fine to also recycle ideas in that way and reuse them. And um, when you are the writer or part of the writers of a data management plan and you have written a good plan with a lot of information, there is also this idea, notion that maybe this is nearly enough to write a so-called data paper. Who has ever written a data paper so far? Is, it, is, it, is, is the concept you're familiar with? Or? Not quite. Um, I think data journal is the overall term for journals that, it sounds silly, sorry, focus on the data side of the project, not on the publication side. So in a data journal, you do you write a publication, but it is about the data that you have collected and the methodology and uh, all kinds of wider context. It's not so much on your hypothesis, your complete project methodology, or even your PhD methodology. And um, there are data journals in different scientific disciplines. Many of these are also uh, peer reviewed. So the quality of these publications is similar in principle to the quality of, let's say, traditional publications. But uh, it can be a relatively cheap way to have an extra publication when you have already a very good description of your data collection or your data generation method. So as a suggestion, um, yeah, you may want to look in your discipline what consists, what exists in terms of data journals. And then again, there is this extra visibility, extra output and so on. So. Um, there is, let's say, that is more in a sense, that could be in a sense the, the public version of your data management plan if you do it properly. Um, it's time already for another exercise. You can sit, keep seated. Um, what we'd like you to do, so I notice I'm already running behind. Um, we have a description of a fake project um, and for this fake project we ask you uh, let me start here then we ask you to come up with a so-called data uh, organization a folder structure it's very basic you have done this tens of times probably um, you work together with uh, your neighbor so um, or neighbors if possible oh, sorry yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, in groups of three, perhaps, there you are. 
And um, we have some nice big papers for you to start writing in a moment. Um, and the idea is that you draft a kind of a folder structure that fits this fictitious project. You do not have much time. Also in the later um, exercises today, we, we don't give you much time, so focus on the main things. Um, when you have time, also consider whether you need a naming convention. How will all the people working with you in this project use the same naming convention so that you always know which file is what? But first, come up with a folder structure. I have some paper for you. Um, how many groups are there? So, it's two and three com practical. Maybe we split. So you can do it with fewer people. If you, or you do it with the four of you, or you share with, maybe you turn around with your neighbor behind you. So, oh yeah. Um, if you collaborate with the lady behind you, you're three. The, the, so, so, and there you are. Um, okay. Pedro, I think it's up to you if you want to join forces here or there. <laughs> the, uh, mm, mm. So, okay. mm. and, mm. so, there you are. Mm -mm. Mm. So, uh -huh. oh, I'm left. And, um, so, yeah. How much time? Ten minutes. Yep. So. Ja, die is onderdeel van de slides. Doe ik zo zelf, want dan staat het antwoord er al volgens mij. Oh ja, nee. Ja, 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 ja,
Nee, dan uh, is het daadwerkelijk allemaal nieuw, ja. Het is wel dat er zo weinig mensen zijn. Ja. Ja. Ik heb altijd het idee dat die niet zo snel naar technische workshops komen. Ik denk dat dat het is. Ja. Dus dan zijn ze allemaal uit hun comfortzone om met deze opdracht te slachten. Ja. Yeah, please go ahead. But you can also keep it in your notebooks if you want. It's just that you have a clear structure with the two of you so that you kind of know how you would approach this assignment. Voor leuke ideeën. Dat is een van de eerste vragen ook die hij had gesteld toen de summer school werd georganiseerd en hij trainer werd van kan ik ook gewoon attenden bij, bij dingen. Ja, ja nog twee minuutjes of zo. Oké okay guys, two more in the minutes left. It's not, it's not. It's not a problem if you're not finished. It's just to get your minds churning. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, here, like in six Monday, the people uh, will be interviewed, but uh, each interviewer will interview all, or yeah, they no, will divide no, it? No, they did 600 interviews, and it was 600 people, so every person was interviewed. One yeah, so there's 600 interviews, and it's done by a group of 20 people. Oh, is it? I think this is not, not like so every... So there's, there will be a total of 600 interviews. I think if I understand her idea, it's like every interviewer gets a folder and every interviewer does approximately 30 interviews. 20 times 30 is... Yeah. 
Yeah, that's why I said approximately. Okay, guys, thank you. Let's continue. Okay, so, guys, sorry, <laughs> love the enthusiasm, but we we have to we have to continue. Yes. Okay, guys. So this was just a small exercise to kind of get your minds going to think about, okay, if I have a project, how should I organize my data? How should I document it? And one of the first things I would like to know, did any one of you ever do this for one of their projects, be it small, be it big, especially big, for example, for the PhD students? Did you do some things for something like this for like, your research, which you're actually spending four years a good deed of your time on, did you ever think about how to organize your data and how to make sure that everything is kept well? And then just having tried it or thinking about that it's an option, is anyone considering doing this maybe for the next project or for the project they're already working on? Because it, I think it can really help you. And Actually, the main goal of this project, oh, wait, yes. <laughs> and then another one, completely forgot this, uh, this part of my slide. Has anyone thought about access rights or author authorization as part of this assignment? Because as you, as you already saw, it's like the data can be pretty sensitive. So maybe not all the data should be visible by anyone or by anyone. So did you already start thinking about this when working on the, on the presentation? Or is this something that you thought, oh, that's actually a good, good idea to think about that access rights and authorization is actually a part of your data organization and part of the things that you have to think about. And then, and that this one is actually pretty specific um, for this one. It's more of an administrative task, which is still very important for your research, even though it's not a research task. Um, who thought about the informed consent forms that every interviewee has to sign? Where do you store them and how do you keep track of them? Good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, after all, from medical science now. <laughs> um, and I would like to see hands. Did anyone think of creating a special folder uh, for storing documentation or metadata about all of the information that you've just gathered? I see yeah. one, yes, two, and nice. Three, okay, well done. So one possible, thi one possible data organization that we made here, and this is by no means the perfect one or the correct one or a good one. Okay, I hope it's good, but it's, it's good enough, but um, probably if I would walk around and start talking with you, you all, all of you would have a different one. And the thing is, there is no such thing as a correct data organization. Um, as long as you have data organization, and then I actually mean organization, I would even like to argue that there is no such thing as a bad data organization, although we have all seen bad data organization, so it does exist. Uh, but it's just to give you an idea about the things that, we can, that you can think about. So we went for a very flat folder structure here, basically. Um, we have the raw data um, with limited access because raw data is still very sensitive because it contains all of the interviews with all of the personal information um, and all of the also maybe um, information that may not be shared. Um, then we have to process MPEG files after anonymization. So that's open to basically people involved in the project. The transcript files. Then we had a separate fo folder for keeping track of all the informed consent. And then again, access is limited because not everybody in the, in the project needs to know about this. Um, we have added a separate folder 
um, to 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 keep track of all the stuff that we're doing for the for for one of the research parts, the the, the sentiment analysis, and then we have a separate folder with all of the documentation of the project. So you can think of think about the project plan, the data management plan, which we find very important, um, but also some some information about how the data is processed, um, how the interviews were structured, etc. Um, then we don't even have said anything about the naming convention. Um, my personal opinion with a naming convention is you can fight holy wars over naming conventions um, because everybody has a different idea about what the perfect naming convention is. I often like to say everybody should be able to say a naming convention, we throw them in a hat, we pick one and everybody just has to agree. Um, it's one of those things where you have to agree on something while kind of realizing that it may, may not be perfect for you. Um, but at least you have a naming convention. So, I mean, I end up with 10 different projects on my computer and they all have different naming convention, but within the project, at least it's similar. So, um, one of the things, this, 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 this data organization assignment, um, so thinking about this, is basically one of the things that you will do when creating a data management plan. And basically, you can actually say it's kind of very much similar to a data management plan, but in a very small form. Because basically, you're thinking about your project, you're thinking about the structure of your project and how to approach things, and you're documenting it. You just write it down on a paper, you may write it down in the documentation folder, but all in all, you will end up with um, a well-thought-out process that you have actually documented. So, uh, a day in a data management plan is a bit more than this, of course. So basically, in a data management plan, you're kind of describing the research data lifecycle, so the entire lifecycle of your project, but then from the perspective of your data. Um, so you're not um, going to talk about which publications uh, you're going to make. Um, you're not going to talk about your hypotheses or your research methodology, but you're going to talk about how you're going to manage your data, how you can make sure that you preserve your results, how you can make sure that you share your results with the world. So basically, you create a plan to tell how the data will be created, how you will document your data, who has access to the data, who may not have access to the data, um, how you are planning to store your data, very important, how you are planning to share your data with your colleagues, with your peers, um, with unknown other researchers, and how you're going to preserve and publish your data. Um, I'll start saying it now, but we'll repeat it many more times. Basically, a data management plan is the place where you can write down what you're going to do in your research data lifecycle, and in which you can communicate to your peers, to your colleagues, but also to yourself, what you're going to do. And it's not set in stone. A DMP is a living document. You can change it throughout the four years or 10 years when you're doing your research. Um, it's just to make sure that everything is written down. And to drive home this point, I would like to say that when you're writing a data management plan, it's often very good to put yourself in the shoes of a reuser. So instead of you being the researcher, you should th think about Okay, if, in t if, for example, um, after my PhD, I'm going to do a postdoc um, and I'm going to continue somebody else's research, what information would I need to be able to continue on this research? So if I want to research whatever I've done over, uh, over the last four years and I know nothing about my project, what kind of information would I need? Um, what would I like to know? Because if you start thinking like that, that is where you're actually making sure that you're preserving the value of your research and not just writing down your process. Because when you're writing down your process, you're using a lot of your implicit knowledge about your product project and a lot of implicit knowledge about your research. And you would actually like to communicate that to the, all the other people because other people didn't spend four years on understanding your project. So you want to make sure that all of this value that you've created over time, that you actually pass that on to other people in the same way that if you um, are working on somebody else's research so 
there's many different ways of um, writing a data management plan. Um, funders have their own data management plan structures and templates. A lot of universities have them. Um, projects have them. For example, the EU has their own data management template. So if you're working for a EU project, then you have to use the EU one. Um, I know that the Dutch uh, national funder has one. If you're being funded by them, you have to use that. So there's all kinds of different ones. But basically, the every data management plan is kind of the same. So I'm quickly going through um, all the different parts and what they mean. Um, just as a sort of guidance so that you kind of know what data management plan is. Now, every data management plan usually starts with a data summary. And this is kind of, you can see it as the management summary of your DMP. So here you will talk about the structure or the, like the, the, the general um, the things that your data has. So um, are you going to reuse data? What types of formats are you using? What are the outputs of your projects? And then we're specifically talking about data outputs of your projects and things related to data, so not your, pu your peer-reviewed publications. Um, and who you think will or should reuse your data after the project so that you already put yourself in the, uh, the shoes of a reuser. Um, this is a very important section which contains a lot of information which you don't know when you have to write it. So basically, do not start with this. Um, sometimes when you, it, it can help you think to think about it. I mean, quite often when writing a paper, people say start with the abstract. Uh, but a lot of people know how hard it is to start with an abstract, uh, write your abstract and then do the rest of the work. Um, well, this is not scientific research. You're allowed to cheat. So please write your abstract after you're done with everything and then just put in whatever nice things you want to have there. Um, you are allowed to start with all of the other work. Um, then, the se then the second section usually is um, the fair section of your DMP. Um, and in this section, which I would say people spend the most time on and should spend a lot of time on um, is quite important. Um, and it's basically meant to help you to describe how you are planning to make your data fair. So how to make it findable, how to make it accessible, how to make it interoperable, and how to make it reusable. Um, we've decided not to turn this into an entire fair session and really explain to you how to make your data as fair as possible. But, um, I'll give you a very quick summary. <laughs> uh, an important part of making your data fair is making sure that you have um, well-documented metadata throughout all of your uh, research. And why is it important to have a lot of metadata? Well, um, I've stolen this, from this idea from a colleague of mine and I really like it. And what he usually says is that a package of cookies contains more metadata than most research data packages. And um, I mean, even the ones that do contain metadata, because you also have a lot of research, meta uh, research data that doesn't have any metadata, but a package of cookies has more metadata. So even, even on the front, you have a nice visual description of, of what you're buying, the, the, the cookie you, you have. There is a text description in which you're basically saying like, well, this is a nice Nutella cookie. Um, you, you kind of know what kind of cookie you're getting. Um, and it's even branded with, your, with, with the organization. Everybody knows Nutella. Um, and people actually, like many people tasted them and thought, oh, I would like to buy Nutella products again. So basically you can see the same here with, with, with research, right? If you're a well-respected researcher, you're well-recognizable, then people are more likely to look for your data. Um, but then on the back of your package of cookies, that's where you find everything that you need to know about your cookie and probably even more than you ever want to know about your cookie. Um, but for the right people, it's actually the right information. Um, so you have all of the ingredients, which you can basically compare to your, um, to your, your technical metadata, to your, um, like what's your data set actually build up of. Um, there's a persistent identifier, which is your EN code. Um, there are some best practices which they follow. All the data sets should, have su should follow certain best practices. Well, you kind of see the same here. A um, lot of details about 
about everything. So I mean, I can make all kinds of weird analogies here, but I think you kind of get, get what I mean, right? There is a lot of information in a relatively small space, and everything, all that information actually helps you as a consumer to understand what product you're buying and to make your buying decision. Because let's be honest, guys, if we would find this in the supermarket, would anybody dare to buy it or to eat it? You will probably go to the nice branded cookies, right? Um, so don't, so what I'm basically trying to say here is, Yes, it can be a lot of work um, to get metadata, to create the right metadata and to make your data fair. Just as it is a lot of work for Nutella to make sure that their branding is super okay. I mean, they spend lots of money on making their branding right. But it is actually what makes other people use the product, what other people help, helps to understand the product. So don't see creating metadata as a pointless exercise, but see it as a way of communicating about your, your data, about your project to others, and to help them to decide to use it. Um, and then there is one part of FAIR um, that I would like to discuss a little bit, because that's something that people sometimes uh, find a bit confusing, but it's very important. That's the accessibility and to a certain uh, degree the reusability um, of, your, of your data. And that's licensing. So one of the worst things you can actually do with your data is not, putting a, not associating a license with it. Um, <laughs> we were already complaining about that when we were making this presentation. We got a template from EUDAT and there was no license on there. Um, so, which would basically mean that, the, that this presentation was created by me and Marianne, we have the copyright on it, and you are not allowed to use it. It's as simple as that. And by just adding one simple logo to my first slide, um, we fixed that. We, we said it was a Creative Commons, uh, a CC BY licensed product, so all of you are allowed to get our presentation, use it, as long as you attribute me and Marianne. We should be good to go. Um, so it's really important to um, associate a license with your work because, as we said already, um, by default it's actually pretty closed off. So if you think, oh, I have open data, I don't really care about what happens with, uh, with, with my project, then you should actual, actually explicitly waive the rights because if you don't do it, people are not really allowed to use it and won't do it. Um, so, licensing is something which is important and that you need to think about when writing your DMP, when writing this section. Um, so, two things to quickly help you, I'm not going completely through this, but a lot of people find it quite hard to select a license, um, but a lot of work has been done for you. So, personally, or I sh shouldn't even say personally, within, uh, within research data management, the Creative Commons licenses are very much an accepted standard. Um, there's lots of flavors to choose, to choose from, um, from very permissive to very not permissive. This is, basic, this is also not a Creative Commons license because this is your copyrights, all rights reserved uh, authorship. Um, pick a flavor that you like. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, um, you that has created a licensing wizard at some point, and there you can basically go through a wizard and it helps you selecting the right um, license for your project. So, just as with the cookies, um, the, the entire goal of making your data fair and describing your data is to put yourself into the shoes of a data re reuser to make sure that you convey all of the information that they need um, and that you just share all of the relevant information with the reusers. Re and when we were talking about fair data at the beginning, somebody already kind of said it, um, but in kind of different words. But the overall goal here is to increase trust. Describe your data well so that other people may be able to trust your data and reuse your data. Because I think somebody, you, it was you, right, that said that a lot of, that there is more fake data lying around than you would hope. <laughs> Yes. 
Yeah, indeed. And there it really helps to have this process because even if you're not completely sure about your data, um, if you, I know that for example, um, they did that a couple of times within high energy physics and other, uh, and also in quantum physics, where people basically said, we have very cool results, but we're not too sure about them. So we're going to publish them and then we're going to ask the community to verify it. So they published their raw data, they published their methodologies, and they basically said, we think we found something very cool, but guys, please start shooting at our ideas because we might have missed something and it might, it might be too good to be true. Yeah, so that will be kind of this part. And I mean, um, oh yeah. And then as a last point, um, as some of you already, as we saw at the beginning, most of you already know a little bit about FAIR, but maybe want to learn more about being FAIR. Um, so there used to be a EU project, FAIRWARE, um, which basically helps you assess your knowledge of the FAIR principles, but also has a lot of material that can actually help you to uh, know more about FAIR. So this, this can be something which is, uh, which is nice to, to, to have a look at if you want to learn more. So after you've described all your data, made it FAIR, um, the next part of, of, of your data management plan is to talk about other research outputs. So we already said kind of that papers are not like your peer reviewed publications are not necessarily a part of your DMP. We have talked about your data, your raw data pr perhaps, but what else is worth managing? Do people have an idea what kind of um, other research outputs we can be talking about here? Yes. Code? code, yes, that's a very good one. Something that a lot of people forget. If you write a lot, if you write code, it's it's just, just as important as any other work you've done, yeah? Other things? I think this is not really practice, but I personally feel it would be good if you would share what you tried what didn't work, like mistakes you made, or a hypothesis that were disproved. Ooh, that's a nice one, I like that one. Yeah, more people should do that, but I think indeed you're right. We, we tend to write about our successes and not about our failures. Oh, nice. It's just an abbreviation, and it's, uh, it's about publishing unsuccessful experiments and unsuccessful results for people to learn. Cool, I like that. So, I like the, kind of like the, uh, the, the examples that we just, just had, and I think there is more, but those were, are some very important categories. So, you should basically describe all kinds of outputs that you will have during your research. Um, and make sure that you, you think about these output outputs and the value of these outputs. Um, I have a couple of examples here. Um, so indeed, I already had FAIR software, that's a good one. So um, if you go to uh, fairsoftware.eu, there's FAIR recommendations for making your software FAIR. Um, because a lot of people have, have thought about, okay, we have, we have this fair for data, but how to do that for software. Um, one product I really like um, is a, a project from CERN. It's called Rihanna, Reproducible Research Data Analysis Platform. And basically the entire goal of Rihanna is that you create some sort of notebook in which you um, have every single step of your, uh, of your data analysis. So on Rihanna, you can find examples, for example, where you can run on, um, and they've done that at conferences also, where basically they did all of the work for finding the Higgs boson from the raw data to the actual plots that were used to proving that the Higgs boson, or not proving, but making it very likely that the Higgs boson exists um, within 20 minutes. They just ran it on the cloud uh, using, um, using a platform like this. So this way, this is very good for open science because other people can actually do all of the work that you did, can see it, can verify it. So if you're not too sure, you can actually say, here you see how I got from my raw data to what I've actually published. 
and you can do it yourself. And you can see if you have a, sometimes when you read a paper, you have some ideas of, I would like to try something different. Well, if you have something like this, then you can actually try something different and see for yourself if your ideas make sense or not. And um, earlier, Marianne also man managed the data papers. So I'm not sure if some of you are um, familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, but Jupyter Notebooks are something that's quite often used for data papers. So then you have a Python notebook in which people basically combine text, pictures, plots, um, and, and the codes to create all of that in a single notebook. And then while reading the paper, you can actually go through all of the steps um, and making sure, or like, and actually understanding what somebody did. So instead of having to infer that from a paper, you can actually see the meat and butter of their application. Then, um, this is where, where the fun, I would say the fun stuff stops and where we have to talk about something that most people don't like to talk about, which is allocation of resources. And resources is just a nice word for saying money. Um, so when you want to manage your data, it, it costs resources. You need time, you need storage space, um, you may need people. Um, so basically, your DMP might actually be a bit too late already to talk about this because quite often uh, people start on the data management plans after they got the funding. Um, it's also kind of the conversation that we have here, right? So the funder wants to know all of the, uh, the costs that are related to your research data output management. Um, they should be in your grant, uh, but a lot of people start thinking about this stuff once they've got the grant. Um, so I guess that this is kind of your wake-up call to make sure that when you have to write this section, that you already have written this section. Uh, so it should actually be pretty straightforward. Um, but think a lot about what it costs to manage your data. And one thing I quite often see what people forget is the cost of preserving your data. Um, because a lot of projects and a lot of funders say, okay, you can spend the money while you are working on the project. Um, and then when they stop with the project, they have 100 terabytes of data and they want to store it. And then you go to your research services provider and they say, okay, we can store 100 terabytes for you, but it will cost X amount of money. And you don't have that. So make sure that you think about all of this from the very beginning, because funders want you to make your, uh, want, want you to have your data management under control. Um, but you have to tell them that you need money for it because somehow they know that you need money for it, but they're not really saying like, here's, your, here's money, go, go ahead and spend it. Um, then a very important part, which is the data security part about sharing and storing. Um, and here you have to think about both during the research, but also after your research. So who are you sharing the data with during your research? So that would be your collaborators, for example. Um, how to make sure that your data is safe. Um, backing it up, maybe if you have very sensitive data, making sure that it's even safer. Um, and then after the res research, who are you going to share it with, how, etc. Um, and then, of course, part of data security is also the sensitive data, making sure that um, if you're handling sensitive data that you do that correctly. Um, and then I would like to hear some examples. Let's see if you can think of typical or non-typical examples of sensitive data. Who has any ideas? Mm -hmm. passwords, keys. Yes, passwords and keys, yes. Personal information. And what, what, what is considered to be personal information? Do you have a couple of examples? Yes, indeed, your name. Um, does anyone know that, for example, IP addresses are considered personal information? Okay. And some other examples, because indeed I've heard now two very good ones, but forgive me, obvious ones. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's a good one. You might get a big fine if you uh, publish the data and other people can just use it. Yeah. Pacing data, maybe more, more sensitive. Yeah, 
Yeah, medical data indeed. That's that's indeed. Earlier we were talking about personal data, and then you also you have two categories of personal data. You have the and then indeed medical data as part of this second very special category of, of highly sensitive data. Legal documents that not is allowed to Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, some very good examples. Um, we have tried a different approach. Um, we thought at least somebody should have the chat GPT plug in this uh, in the summer school. You can use that for your summer school bingo if you have one. Um, so we have, act we have asked some unexpected examples of sensitive data in research and science. Or actually, Marianne did. I, I should be. I shouldn't take the. the <laughs> yeah. So here, for example, one example is animal research data. Um, so if you look, for example, if you if you do research about very sensitive animal species, then this data might actually be quite sensitive because uh, people may use dislocation data to make sure that the animal actually gets extinct. Um, same with environmental research data. Uh, air or water quality management may reveal sensitive information about locations here or there. Um, vehicle telemetrics, I mean, knowing where a car is going might not be that that these these communities are well preserved and that they don't um, well that they're not known and that they become some sort of tourist trap um, where they, they they have to deal with everything that comes with with being known in the Western world for example so then you kind of have a um, they have a right for their protection and that's why you want to keep the data safe um, so Thinking about all of this and making sure that you take the right measures to, to, to do the protection is something that you need to do. Um, you're kind of obliged as a researcher uh, to, to do that because we're all responsible. Uh, um, but one thing here is what is very important, you don't have to invent it yourself. Um, and it's actually usually your university doesn't want you to invent this yourself. Um, a lot of universities spend a great deal of time and money on thinking about how to handle sensitive data because in the end they are responsible. Um, so while writing your DMP, make sure that you get in contact with the right people at your university or at your employer um, to talk about, um, about the security of your data. Um, to make sure that you don't have any, that you don't have missed any sensitive data and that you're handling the sensitive data the right way. And kind of the same, it, it kind of goes hands in hand with the last one, um, which is the ethics. Um, so here we have put a link to uh, Alea, which is the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity. Um, like I said, we're all responsible researchers. We're all kind of obliged to do this. Um, so we need to make sure that we that we that we are proper researchers and are integral researchers. Um, and also here, if you're not too sure about your research or if you want to discuss this with someone, every university um, has multiple contacts, ethics boards, um, data supporters that are all very willing to help you. Um, I do a lot of training for data supporters, and usually they are like well, we have difficulties finding the user, so please. Um, they are really, really eager to help you. Um, they have a lot of knowledge, um, and that may actually makes your work just a lot less hard. And then, like I said from the beginning, now we have covered all of the six parts of your DMP, um, and then you can go back to the top um, and write your data summary. Basically, summarize everything that you thought about in all of these earlier sections. And then it's uh, yeah, whatever I can do is uh, as well as to do the introduction to the other main. Oh yeah, that's good. 
Yeah, I'll give the floor to you again then. We should have practiced this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah, other way around. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Whatever I learn in this summer school, there is a bit of technology involved. Uh, good. Um, what we're actually asking from you is to put on the hat of a data management plan reviewer. Not the author, but a reviewer. Who has worn that hat before? <laughs> to some extent? <laughs> yeah, so a researcher comes to you and say, I need help with my data management plan, or I think I have my data management plan, can you have a look and review it for me before I send it off to the funder? Um, so that is again the other perspective. And um, there are a lot of data management plans out there in the world. And we're going now through a couple of examples from real data management plans. Some of them are anonymous. And we would like to know whether you think these are good parts or bad parts. Of course, it's not about bashing colleagues, um, but it's also good to know, okay, why do I find this a good example? Can I use this approach myself? Why do I think this is not a good example? What's missing? So. Um, the structure we had before was basically also from the European Commission as a funder. Um, some of these sections are called differently than Jorik went through them, but that's not a problem. So when you read this, who thinks, and this was in a section called data description, so where the author of or author, or authors of the DMP described basically the data. Do you think this is a good kind of description? So and if you, can I see some hands who thinks it's good? Um. Mm. Or moderate, or... Mm. 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 Any thoughts? I see a hand. Okay. Too general. You're nodding, yeah? I also thought that the text is too much, but it's nice that the other class who has the table to just, you know, be more clear. Okay. Any further thoughts? Maybe there's some information, some more information that would be interesting. Also, the data will be allowed access to it and so on. I don't know. It's not included on this. No, that's right. Yeah. Um, so no one is saying it must be in tabular form. On the other hand, I hear from your colleagues they find it more concrete if it is in a tabular form. So yeah, I would say that's a recommendation to do it. Yeah. Okay. Next example. Is it good? Is it weak? Is it Italy, yes, but <laughs> Sorry? Italy is good, but not always. Uh, mm -hmm. It works like that. that you know, you can start the field war once all the organization are being updated. Mm -hmm. So yes, in a Italian world, yes, that's perfect to me, but still, I never work like that. <laughs> okay. I think in the first version of a data management plan, which you, which you write probably in the month four or month six or something into the project, this is a good statement. When you update your data management plan, let's say halfway, this is no longer acceptable, I would say. So there you see this concept of a living document, and when you would review it or to help others, keep in mind what is the state of the project. Uh, 
Uh, well, you see different practices. Um, I know of a couple of universities who demand that when uh, you publish all your data in the repository at the end of your PhD research, you must also add the data management plan. And then it's still called a plan, but actually it's accounting for what you have done. So if you want to go through the, that work, it would be nice to say, okay, we did it so and so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And I think it's actually a very good practice to ask for this accounting of what, how you've worked, yeah. Oh. And how about this one? Sorry, oh, I missed the question, sorry. I also wanted to ask, with the file formats, some come with a where you have to state the key in the metadata, and some come with a key in the metadata. Part of the data, so I'm asking if it's really, really, really crucial to submit a separate uh, data description or something when presenting your mm. What would you do? I think the data itself comes in one or more formats. Some people will have PDF or tabular format or whatever. The metadata you usually enter at the moment that you register it with an archive or a repository because then you have fill out. Some metadata, was that what you mean? Or? Oh. More specifically, oh. I was working with the NetCD of data. Yep. And before you write the data, it requires that you give the metadata before you save everything. So in that okay. case, that you've written everything in there, you need to also yep. your data somewhere else. Yeah, that's a good question. What would you do? I think, I the think, I uh. think that in your specific mm. example, uh. it should be it should, be, it should be fine because, mm. uh, like you said, in that CDF, it's part of the yep. standard that you have your accompanying metadata with your, uh, with, with your files. So if you would be looking for metadata relating to CDF data, you would actually look in a file. You wouldn't look at a separate um, thing. So in this case, I would say go with that. Um, my general advice is go with the best practices in the field of research you're mm. working in because different fields of research have different maturities. Um, for example, if you're working high energy physics, um, they are very far ahead with sharing data because of the nature of their research. So there is very good standards and very good practices. Um, and even if they would contradict some of the best practices that we have for, that we have, that are written down, I would go with that because everyone in your community expects that. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my general advice. Um, try to follow the community standards as much as possible. Um, if they don't exist, mm. then I would definitely say um, do it separately and make sure that, that it is described. So, mm. But as a general rule of thumb, um, descriptive metadata is not part of the file, so you would have it on a separate location. Mm. Uh, but if the standard says otherwise, Go ahead. Mm. Oh. Okay. So, uh, this was about the section on standards, talking of standards and ethics. Yes, please. Uh, I'm not sure about the part that we will follow these guidelines. I mean, they are famous guidelines that everyone knows. Okay. I mean, which steps they want to do. I mm -hmm. don't know if it's very vague. Okay. You find it vague and confusing. Uh -huh. Any other opinions? Uh, No? This
This could be a situation where they refer, so I'm not from that field of research, this could be a situation where they refer to, indeed, the community standards, and then for, some, for a reviewer coming from that community, this is perfectly fine, because they recognize, okay, this is how we do things in our world. But I agree with you, when you're a generic reviewer uh, hired by the European Commission, this can be pretty tough to judge correctly. So Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that, so not to be too brutal, but I think that happens in international projects a lot. You can hear it. I'm not a native speaker of English either. And we have sometimes issues in making clear text here. Okay. Okay. It's almost time for um, the break. I'll stop this and move on to the next exercise. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, there are more examples in here. Um, we have some, okay, what is good and what is not so good. So a data management plan is about data. Like you already said, it's not about publications. As a reviewer, um, I get very suspicious when they write a lot about publications because then you probably have not understood what a DMP is for. So that is a, a kind of filter. Um, it should be clear that when it's not a PhD research, but for instance, something with a consortium, all partners have clear roles and show that their commitment is also visible through it. And it's nice if you show that you had a conversation, for instance, with the legal department or the IT department to help you in the legal and storage questions. So, and be very mindful of words like should and would and possible. That's not good. Uh, so any reviewer should point at that and saying, hey, this is not a plan, this is an intention. That's not what we asked for. Okay, um, this is what we will do after the break. And we will have it on screen later on as well. We spend the, the hour after the break on one hands-on, bless you, on one hands-on exercise, writing a data management plan for the same veteran tapes project. So you know which project you represent, in a sense. Um, and it is for that project that you will, under time pressure, so only high level, write a data management plan. Um, we have a template, which is the European Commission's one, because that might be relevant for most of you in the room. Um, but like Jorik said, any other funder has typically the same topics addressed. So you have 25 minutes in, your, in a pair work to pick at least part of the DMP to fill out. So use it also for discussion when you're not sure. After 25 minutes, two pairs join up and compare each other's work. So, hey, nice to see that you took this differently. Um, and um, so there you can have this reviewer role in a sense. Is it clear? Um, of course, within these boundaries, okay, nothing can be perfect in 25 minutes. And um, keep some notes, please. And then the note takers share what they noted. So what was what stood out, things that are completely unclear, nice solutions, whatever. Let's break. Um, final question for you, what is this? Sorry? I would like to, I would like to, to, to say that the Finnish people in the back should know, as, no, world's, like as the world's biggest consumers, uh, I, I, kind of. 